Now what I'd like to get into next is working on what I call the faster kick there is. Of course, low kicks are quicker than high kicks. Straight line kicks are quicker than curved line kicks. When you kick with the front leg, it's usually quicker than when you kick with the rear leg. Now watch how I execute this particular technique. See if it fits into your own choices, your own nature. See if it seems to feel comfortable with the way you're built. Now traditionally, most karate practitioners execute a front kick in this fashion. Watch how I execute this. My partner Jim face me. Again, assuming my fighting position, which I like, keeping my hand here in front of me, always being able to strike and retreat, put the space cushion between me, follow through with my Sunday punch or my powerful kick. Most people will cock the knee first, point the knee at the target, then fire the front kick, hitting with the, either the ball of foot. If you've got a nice hard shoe on, you don't need to hit the ball of foot, you hit with the toe lift. Some styles, like the Weichiru style, can actually break four, five, six inches of wood or bamboo with just the tip of the big toe. Now, I assume most people don't have a nice strong toe like that. I know mine's not that uh, strong. But now watch how fast this particular technique is. Let's see where your speed is. Jim, just face me like this, please. All right, come up just a little closer. Now, hold your hands right here in front of your groin like this. A little bit lower now, because I'm not going to be kicking that high. And let's see how fast you can slap your hands together. In and out, real fast. Go, slap it. Real fast, real fast. All right, now watch this timing speed, OK? Now get them a little closer to the groin so we make sure. Now watch this kick. I'm going to put a front kick right up here in the groin. I'm not going to make contact, so don't worry about me slipping up here. And let's just see if you can just touch my, my hand. You touch my hand, I mean touch my foot, I'll consider it a block. All right, watch how fast you can make this particular kick. This is how you learn how to execute it. Well, let's try it again now, Jim, real fast, real fast. Does everybody see what I mean? I've got a professional black belt in front of me. He knows what's coming. All he's got to do is move his hands about six inches to touch my foot. If I can get my foot from the ground all the way up to the groin and out before he can react to it, it shows you how fast that kick can be. Now watch how I want you to work on this kick. The secret lies in your hip movement. You learn to kind of keep the leg relaxed so you can move at maximum speed and lift the leg off the ground with the hip move. Notice my knee is not bending, but I'm lifting that foot off the ground through the hip movement. This movement comes from one of the uh, Tai Chi forms of Kung Fu. It's one of the faster moves there is in all fighting. And basically, instead of cocking the kick before I fire it, which takes an extra step, I'm leaving that little cock out. I don't cock it. I don't recoil the leg first. What I'm doing is basically going on a straight line, straight from the floor, straight to the target. Watch my foot in slow motion. Starting to lift with the hips. See my knees not bending. See my knees not bending. Then at last minute, I bend the body down as I snap it. So I'm sort of cocking right at the end of it. Watch that movement one more time. Lifting the leg with the hip, right at last minute, I cock. It's an exceptionally fast movement. You can be sitting there talking to someone, and you might want to distract them like so. Please, sir, I really don't want to fight. Now, what are they looking at right at this moment? They're looking at your hands. So they've gotten their attention with the hands, so watch it again. Notice my position, I'm here. Please, sir, I really don't want to fight. Please. Now they're taking a good look at my hands and real fast, bang, come up with that kick. As soon as you hit them with a kick, bang, step in with a punch. As soon as you hit them with a punch, step back, come back with that side kick I show you, take off running. Guarantee you, they may chase after you. <laughs> but chances are they're going to be crawling on their knees if that may be the case. So again, work the kick. I don't recommend firing that particular kick if you're barefoot. Try to see if you can execute it with shoes on. It's not something that's going to come easy for you. Again, it's not a power kick, but if you hit the target just right, and you know what target I'm talking about, guarantee that person will stop. I've seen people hit, not hard, but I've seen them hit so fast that, act, that they actually threw up before the person even recoiled his leg. Okay, That's a very dangerous, potent technique to work on it. Again, don't try it on your friends, but if this seems to fit your nature and the way you're physically built, try to execute it, try to find a way of practicing it, and use it. I guarantee you, it will work.
Okay, our next technique is the Sunday Punch. Now this gets into one of my favorites because one of the most natural, easiest things for me to do in a self-defense context when someone grabs me or pushes me or shoves me or tries to hold on to me, aggravate me or set me up or whatever the situation might be is a good old American right cross. Some people call it the good old American uppercut, but when I say American uppercut, we think about the little front kick we worked on before. Now, here's a situation I'm talking about. Let me put my pads down for one second. Let's say someone comes up and just grabs you, starts to push you. There's so many soft fence movements and soft fence books where they show you, you come over here and you grab, you come up, you go for the throat, you break the elbow, you come over, you chop down, you hit the here, you step on the elbow. I mean, you can go on and on and on. There's 20 million thousand things you can do. Another school will teach something like this. Somebody comes up to grab, as soon as you grab, you clasp your hands over the top like this. You step back, you come down, you come up, you punch like that. Some of the Aikido schools, they'll take you over like this. They'll flip you this way. The Jiu-Jitsu schools, they'll take you into a wrist flex or something like that. The Judo schools, they'll step in here, they'll do a, uh, a hip throw or a seonagi, something over the shoulder. My simple point of view is, when I'm approached and I'm in that situation, just a good old-fashioned American bah! Sunday punch. Now, some people prefer to fire a straight line punch, what we call a right cross, or the karate techniques, they call it a chudonzuki, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the Korean styles have another name for it. Or come across with a curved line punch, which is what we call a hook punch. Now, what I want you to do now is pay attention to my partner and I as we show you how to mechanically execute these techniques in the correct fashion. All right, Jim face straight ahead. Now we're going to hold our hands up here like a kickboxer. I want you to pay attention to the entire structure of our body as we execute. Now whenever you throw a punch to get maximum power in it, you want to try to step into it a little bit. So what Jim and I are going to do now is we're going to work on a simple straight right hand. Now watch our movements here, slow motion. We're going to start to sit down, start to sit down on the movement. Okay, now watch. We're going to start to torque the shoulder and the hip. That sort of gives us a little leverage. Now as we start to torque, we're going to shift our weight towards the front foot. See our weight shifting? And as we torque and shift, we're going to stick the right hand straight out. Straight out and pull it right back. Now you don't have to start your punch up high like we're doing ours. In a self-defense situation or realistic context, you don't have to worry about recoiling the punch like a professional fighter would do. You can start it off the shoulder, you can start it off the chest, you can start it down here on the hip. But basically, I want to try to keep your hand up in this basic general area here. The karate people fire theirs off the hip. I don't like that. You just well have the hand starting down here in their pockets. Boxers keep theirs up real high. But in a street situation, you don't have time to get positioned here. Sometimes you'll be here, somebody push you off balance, and you've got to learn to fire from that off-balance position. Like in the uh, Kempo system, uh, Master Ed Parker teaches this principle called point of origin. So you can't start here. This is not my point of origin. My point of origin is I've been shoved, I'm off balance, I've got to get that right hand up. So I might do a recoiling technique, then come back with my right hand. So keep that in mind now. What is your point of origin? Your opponent is not always going to be standing straight in front of you like we see in these self-defense books. Face me, Jim. One guy's here and the other guy's there and he steps out like, oh, and he steps out, oh, straight punch. Doesn't work that way in a street situation. You might have somebody that tricks you, says, look, I really don't want to fight, you know, but you don't mind, let me get my wallet before I leave. And the guy bends over to grab it, Wah! and that's where the fight starts. You've been hit first. Or maybe you're at a bar and somebody says, wait, okay, I'm going to leave, but let me finish my drink. He picks the drink up, he starts to pour the beer down his throat, he gets the beer about right here, he drops the bottle, pow! And from right here, bah, he turns and sucker punches you. You don't know what your point of origin is going to be. So always be ready for that. Keep your eye on your opponent. Keep your distance. Keep your position. And chances are, you've got 99% of the situation already in control. Now let's work on that right hand again. Jim, you do it straight ahead. I'm going to do it on a slight angle. Watch the variation now. All right, start to sit down. Start the to torque. Start to shift your weight forward. Snap the right hand in. Now this time as you throw it, I want you to step into it. Watch me. We start to sit down. Just as you get ready to throw it, step in as you fire the punch. As you step in, you always get more leverage, more authority behind that technique. Let's try it once again. Start to sit down, start to torque, step in, snap that punch. 
Now let's work on the hook punch, or as the karate people call it, the ridge hand a little bit. All right, watch us. Put your weight forward on your front foot just a little bit. Now watch this. Start to sit back down on your rear heel. Let's start again, your weight on your front foot. Start to sit back down on your rear heel. Now as you sit back down on rear heel, torque your hips and your shoulder like so. Notice we haven't released the punch. Now at this last moment, release the punch in and out. If I see that punch goes in and out, back reposition. Slow motion, sit, torque and fire. Back reposition. Now this time I want you to sit and fire at the same time. Ready, fire. Boom. Notice how the body shifts from one foot to the other. As you shift that body weight, again you're learning to step into that punch, step into that punch to get your leverage. Now watch. Jim, I want you to face me. I'm going to pick these pads up here. This is a way that you can develop your own punches in your karate studio. If you're working inside a karate studio, you can buy yourself a set of these hand pads. You don't have to have these pads. You can work with a heavy bag, or you can have somebody take a regular set of boxing gloves and just turn them over the other way, slide your hand in reverse, and just let them punch them, OK? Jim faced me straight on over here. Now I want you to throw a simple straight right hand, the sunny punch of right hand about half speed, fire it straight in. Notice he's firing right hand to my right hand. Does everybody see that? Fire it again. See how he's stepping into the punch. Now he's going to fire left hand to left hand. Watch him come back with the hook punch. All right, a little bit slower. Again, hook punch. Now watch. I want you to go right left. Does everybody see the angles I've got on these pads? One is pointing straight towards him. The other is coming at a 90 degree angle. All right, straight right hand. Come back left hook. One, two. Real fast. Boom, boom. One, two. Now let's reverse it. Let's go left hook. Come back right hand. Left, back right hand. And you can work on your punches individually. Or you can work on them in combination. Because whenever you execute one of these Sunday punches, folks, I don't care what the situation, it will work. I've seen it work with somebody lying flat on the back. I've seen it work with people sitting down. I've seen it work with people standing up. Now, <clears throat> sometimes if you get caught inside of a telephone booth, it's kind of hard to punch and kick. But we've got something coming up in a second for that. Our next technique is for those of you who like to work from the inside. I know instinctively my nature of fighting is I don't like to punch, I don't like to kick. Those zones are too far away from my opponent. I like to get about elbow distance from my opponent. Within range where I can work what we call the headbutt, I can bite him on the neck, bite him on the chin, that sort of thing. All right, my partner now is John Graydon. He's a member of the uh, United States World Karate Championship team. Now, position against me. A lot of times, someone will grab you or approach you or surprise you. For example, I remember one time I was in this motel lobby and this person came running up behind me and he reached out and grabbed my wrist. And as he grabbed my wrist, he spun around. As he spun around, I was surprised. So my only instinctive thing to do, do was I just slapped you know what out of Wow! And as soon as I slapped him, I figured that would subdue him because he had taped his hands up. He'd gotten in a sweatsuit. It's 12 o'clock at night at midnight. I'm on my way to a party with friends of mine, a couple of them with little kids. And here this person is bragging about trying to jump me. And I'm saying, wow, this is like my worst nightmare. I'm in the middle of an insane asylum. As soon as I spun around, I hit him. What did he do? He rushed in and grabbed me. Just as soon as he grabbed me, here I'm locked up. I go, wait a minute, I'm a, I've got street clothes on. I can't throw a good kick at this distance. I can't get my Sunday punch off. The man was a professional fighter anyway. And I'm saying, what am I going to do? So all I did was when he grabbed me, I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, wow, you actually got your hands on my body. So what I did is I took my hands and I just locked him as tight as I could get him. And real fast, his face, notice where his face is. It's right straight in front of mine. And on your forehead, right up here at your hairline, your skull is very, very thick. Some people, their skull is, is more than a quarter of an inch thick. 
and you can break things quite quite adequately with that part of your head. And I just took my forehead and did what we call the head butt. I just drove my head straight to his face. Bah, bah, twice real fast. Stepped back and did a real fast front kick below the groin. Now he was already finished off with the two head butts. I did not hit him as hard as I could have hit him. I just wanted to draw a little pain, let him know that, hey, don't touch my body. This is my property. You know, you either ask permission or you must come to me with some kind of authority. Now watch that movement again. John, grab me. Now watch. He can grab me straight arm, bend your arms and lock up tight. Sometimes you grab, you got these big old 18 inch arms uh, people that are so strong you can't move once they grab you. You don't have to move. You don't have to move your arms. You don't have to move your legs. You don't have to be able to twist, dance and do like some kind of a fancy judo throw from here. All you got to do is hold them to them to make sure they're not going to go anywhere and drive forward. As you drive forward, turn your head down, point your chin down as you go in. And try not to drive your forehead into their mouth because otherwise their teeth are going to lacerate your head up here and you're going to end up having to go get some stitches. If you hit any part of this head up here, any part of that face region, it's quite easy to bust up the, break this cheekbone here or to break up his nose and blood will flow once you cut any part of that man's face. It's an excellent technique, I hope. <laughs> Your first street altercation, hopefully you don't end up inside of a telephone booth with some 400 pound man, okay? Otherwise, you're gonna be sitting there thinking, gee, what can I do? Another thing you can do is just reach out there real nice and politely with your teeth, grab right a hold of their chin and hold on to that chin. And if you can look at me now, I'll take my finger and put it in my mouth and simulate it someone's chin. You can put their chin right in your mouth and hold on to them and still talk to them. I give you your money, kneel down on your knees, say you're sorry, you can make them do anything you want. Just hold on that chin real tight. You can spit, spit later, but I guarantee you, when you lock on that chin or lock on the side of the neck, they'll do anything you want. Especially those of you out there who think you're rape victims. You know, you can kind of go along with a, hey, hey, this is nice. Pull the victim close to you. If you can't reach over there, grab your hand full of some sand and put it in your eyes real fast. Reach up there and grab that chin. You lock on that chin and you hold on that chin and don't let go, and I guarantee you, you'll be in a good position to either follow through with the headbutt or start the headbutt and then go into the bite. Sounds exciting, doesn't matter. What counts is, does it work or not? Can you survive or not? In a self defense situation, there's no such thing as morality. See? <clears throat> so, were you in a situation where there's only one value which must which must be sustained, and that is your survival value. Then you put all other values aside until you have survived that situation. Then you reestablish and reset your original set of standards. Okay? So remember that in a situation of a crisis, there's only one value, and that is survive. So don't worry about legalities, don't worry about morality and all that other hogwash. Okay? Because when your life is at stake and no one's there to protect you, Forget about pride, that comes later, okay? Before any other value can mean anything, you must first survive. That is the most supreme of all values. And I'm trying to show you how to safeguard that and to maintain your self-assurance that that will always be there. Okay, now we're getting into a territory which is sort of my favorite. Restraining holes, restraining locks. Arm drags into a restraining hole, arm drags into restraining locks. This is a good one for bouncers of nightclubs to use. Sometimes you're at a party and someone's messing around, John, and they might swing at you or something like that and you gotta block it and take them from here and go into some sort of restraining hole, lock them up like so. Now notice what I've done here, turn around, I've got his hand here and what I can do is reach up and grab his hair and guide him nicely in any direction he wants and get rid of him. So there are a number of different types of restraining holes or come alongs. One of my favorites is this, and this is one I recommend you use it. I remember back in 1968, 69, I was uh, 
I'm trying to utilize some of my judo expertise and uh, uh, a buddy of mine, Igor Sasepin, was, uh, the, he was a, one of the national judo champions at the time. Matter of fact, I think he took a, a bronze, medal, bronze medal at the games. And uh, I was trying to throw him down, use some of my wrestling expertise on him. And every time I would stick my arm out to get near him, I was pretty good at diving at someone's legs. One of my favorite moves is I used to tap the person's forehead like that, drop straight down. As I came down, I'd always keep my hands near the person's body. And as soon as I got near the ground, I'd always grab the leg and do a takedown. Because I found most people, once you got them on the ground, especially karate people, they can't punch and kick. And once you got them on the ground, they're pretty helpless. I like to fight on the ground. I like to fight in at elbow distance. So the sooner as I can get the person on the ground, the better I like it. Now watch. Every time I would get my hands near him, what he would do, get your hands near me. What he would do, he'd reach out, grab my wrist. Now watch this move of how it's executed. Stick your hands out. He'd grab my wrist. Notice how I'm grabbing his wrist. Lock tight. Now watch my body position. What I'm going to do is, just like they do in Tai Chi, we're to come up and block. Pull your opponent towards you. As you pull him towards you, right last minute, you drop down. You break his balance. See the moment he dropped his balance, broke his balance, back reposition. So as soon as I grab, I'm doing a step back. What I'm doing now is what we call an arm drag. I'm dragging. And right at last minute, I break his balance. As I break his balance, watch. I spin the elbow over. Notice the elbow is pointing up. As I point it up, I'm going to sink his elbow right into my armpit. Watch me as I drop down. Boom! Everybody say I'm coming down on. So I'm coming down on the armpit, up on the wrist. Now watch as I come up on the wrist. As I come up on the wrist, I'm keeping the wrist flex on him. Now from here, I'm going to sit down. As I sit down, watch as it drives my opponent all the way to the ground. Take him all the way down to the ground. Now from here, I can hold him in a simple restraining hold, such as take my foot, place it over his shoulder, I'm going to apply pressure a little down from the shoulder socket here as I push down on my leg, up on his hand, that hurts. Or put my toe over his bicep, fold his arm in, lock it into place, and again, that's very painful. Yet he's completely helpless at this point. Now, from here I can take him into many different finishing holes, there's all kinds of little judo holes where they have them down like this, put them in the choke holes with the feet over the neck, that sort of thing. You can break his arm from here, or you can walk up and down his, his back here, knee him in the spine cord, kick the groin, come up and knee the kidneys and what have you. All right, John, up for a second. Now watch this one more time. The opponent starts to approach you as the hands come forward. Grab, step back, pull, breaking his balance. Spin the wrist flex up over into the arm lock. Is that basically what I mean? So I have a shoulder lock on him. And if you do this really fast, pow, guarantee you, you will dislocate his shoulder. Nine out of ten times when this is done for real, you don't end up pinning your opponent on the ground. You end up dislocating his shoulder. That's an excellent technique if you don't want to really hurt somebody or bruise them. So when the uh, legal repercussions come, you go, gee, officer, there's no bruises. I didn't lay my hand on it. I don't see any blood. Now, I don't seriously recommend you doing that. But you bigger people that got good grips, this is an excellent technique to use to restrain someone. It's one of my favorites. Okay, let's get into one of my personal favorites. If, it, if I ever got in a street fight, and I'm often asked, uh, Mr. Lewis, what would you do if you got in a street fight? I mean, uh, would you use one of your famous kicks or punches or something like that? No. I've had a lot of kicks that landed that did not work. I've had a lot of punches that landed that had no effect. But every time I've applied a finishing hold, whatever the finishing hold may be, it has never, ever failed me. Now watch this finishing hold, and this is how I'd like you to practice it. Now, a lot of times, 
when you're up against a taller person, and I'm real close to the person, and he's getting ready to shove me, punch me, or kick me, or something like that, I might do something like this. Stand on this side. Now watch, so you can better see this. As soon as I see him making a move, what's what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to take my hand and cup it right behind his neck. As I cup it right behind his neck, I'm going to drop him down into sort of a front choke. Now watch. I cup the back of his head, pull his head to my chest. As I pull it to his chest, I'm going to spin the neck and lay his head flat against my chest. Watch how quick this movement can be. Flat, lock here, and sit right down. And you got the big man kneeling down at your mercy in a matter of seconds. Now watch. Just turn this way a little bit. Now watch what I'm doing. Notice I've got his head straight into my chest. I've spun his chin so his ear lies flat against my chest. I'm taking my lock right behind the hairline, clasping my hands. I'm pulling in with my arms and forward with my chest. Guarantee you the big man will bow down to you very, very quickly. That really hurts and it's very, very fast. Now here's another one I like to do. All right. Let's say I'm facing somebody. I have the altercation again. Now this is what we call a cross arm naked choke hole. Now what I'm going to do is this. Right up and down each side of your opponent's neck. Lift your chin up, John. We have two arteries running, one on this side, one on this side. Stay away from this windpipe in the front of the neck. What we're going to be doing is applying pressure on an angle, not coming straight in from the side, but on a slight angle, up towards the ear and up towards the ear. See the V that my hands are forming? I'm putting pressure right where my knuckles are touching. Now, as you apply pressure there,